Welcome to the Ask a Roofer podcast, where all your roofing questions find their answers. Your hosts, Megan Ellsworth and Lauren White, peel back the layers of the roofing world to reveal the knowledge, tips, and FAQs you've been curious about. From shingles to skylights, metal to asphalt, we're here to demystify the system above your head. So get ready to ask, learn, and explore the fascinating world of roofing, one question at a time, on the Ask a Roofer podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Ellsworth. And I'm Lauren White. And, and I'm John Chan. Ask a Roofer. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and we have John Chan here. This is the Ask a Roofer podcast. Welcome, welcome. Um, John, let's dive right in and have you introduce yourself. Okay, great. So my name is John Chan. I'm one of the principals of the Durable Slate Company. or a historic um, roofing company that works all over the country and actually even abroad. So we work on slate, um, clay tile, and copper roofing. Wow. I didn't know y'all were international. That's so cool. Yeah, we've done a few interesting projects uh, outside the country. Super cool. Very cool. What's been your favorite? Outside the country? Yeah. Um, gosh. It's hard to say. Well, Trinidad was really cool because it was the Red House, which is their House of Parliament. And it got destroyed in a coup attempt back in the 90s, and they had all kinds of issues with it. So, you know, we were brought in in 2016, first as a consultant. And then um, we went there and, and trained up their guys and did all the most complicated parts of the roof so that they could keep it um, on a low budget and um, have guys in the future that they can actually use for historic roofing. But they didn't, um, they didn't demand uh, that these guys be experts right away. So it was pretty cool. Wow, wow that's a cool awesome. attempt. Pretty yeah. Cool. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> um, so how would you say slate roofing performs in various weather conditions, such as, you know, like heavy rain, snow, mm -hmm. heat? Um, what's its performance like? Well, the performance of slate, actually all those historic roofing products are fabulous. You know, if you go mm -hmm. to any of the uh, old European countries, you know, London or, um, Edinburgh or uh, uh, different cities in Germany, you'll see slate roofs that are literally hundreds of years old. So they work fabulously. The only problem with slate is that if they're not installed correctly, what happens is in windstorms and hailstorms, you get major problems because the slate isn't installed correctly. So then you've got issues. Yeah. Is just out of curiosity, are those issues just like slate breaking and falling off or, or, is, or am I incorrect? Right. So, um, just to give you an example, you know, we took a tour of, uh, one of the Welsh quarries, Penryn quarry oh, and, cool. uh, St. Asaph was, uh, finished in 1495. They didn't re-roof until 1968. It's documented that this roof was over 470 years old. Oh my God. <laughs> right. Exactly. So slate has to be hung on the nails. And what I mean by that is that the slate is punched or drilled in, in such a fashion that if you nail the uh, slate in and it hangs on the roof, it can uh, withstand a lot of wind, a lot of hail and everything else. But if it's over nailed, you tend to put stress on the slate and put hairline cracks in it. So what happens is a windstorm or a hailstorm comes and you've got a ton of broken slate. Another thing that can be done is a slate's under nailed. So instead of nailing the, the slate flush and hanging on the nails, it's a little bit loose so that that nail protrudes a little bit. It's a little bit proud. So the slate on top sits on the nail and doesn't sit flush. So when somebody steps on it or you get wind or, or hail or something else, it vibrates and the slates crack and break. Um, here's an interesting story. Uh, 
we did a new slate roof in Coral Gables and it wasn't, but maybe a month later they had a cat four hurricane direct hit. And the GC called and I saw the call. I was just like, Oh my gosh. I'm like, did anything happen? So I, I answered the phone and he said, Hey, he goes, just to let you know, your new slate roof, not one slate missing with cat four direct hit, you know? And uh, he said all around the slate and, and tile roofs are, they're all over the ground. And wow. so that kind of goes to show you a slate roof that's installed correctly lasts like I said, it can be for hundreds of years. You go in Edinburgh, like I said, a lot of those roofs, they're well over 100 years old, a couple 200 years old. You know, I visited the Delible Quarry down in Cornwall, and um, he was telling me that their slates last between about 240 and 275 years. And I said, that, that's pretty exact. He goes, well, yeah, because you know, a lot of these buildings are hundreds of years old. So at that point, we we know how old these buildings are. He said, this building right here is 250 years old. And he said, the slate's still holding up, but he said, we'll probably have to re-roof in, you know, about 20 years. So, you know, that's the funny thing about natural slate and, and good slate products. Now there's different grades of slate, obviously. I mean, if you have low grade slate from uh, India or China or uh, South Africa, uh, some of those Brazilian slates, they're not so great. They're not going to last that long. Even your old Pennsylvania black slates don't last that long. But really good top notch slate like Buckingham, your uh, slate from Vermont, uh, your Del Castillo from Spain, uh, your Welsh slate. Uh, like I said, Delible out of uh, Cornwall. I mean, those slates will last 150 years, 200 years, 250 years, sometimes more. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So kind of going off of that, considering how long slate can last, can you touch on the sustainability aspect and even the energy efficiency of a slate roof in, compared to other materials out there? Sure. A, a slate roof, if you think about what slate is, it's a very dense rock. So it started off as a sedimentary rock along the riverbanks, and then it got basically turned up on end and pushed down into the earth. And you got a lot of heat and a lot of pressure. And all of that heat and pressure made that slate super hard. So what happens is cold air or hot air tends to stay on that side of the slate. So it's it's got this natural ability to um, keep the, the weather where it's supposed to be. The other nice thing about slate is that, um, you know, when you lay it, it doesn't seal itself like shingles do, uh, like rubber does. So it's got a natural ventilation and it can it can breathe. Now I've got a make a little cautionary statement about that because there's a lot of installers that will install ice and water shield on the whole roof prior to installing a slate roof. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. The reason is, is that you've now cut off any ability for the air to move. And I've seen it time and time again, both in New Orleans, actually all over Louisiana and Florida, where they've ice and water shielded a whole roof before putting on the slate or tile. And then you've got condensation issues. You know, they've mm -hmm. finished their attics. They crank the um, AC because it's, mm -hmm. you know, 95 degrees out with a hundred degrees hu or a hundred percent humidity. And they've cranked the AC down to, you know, 67 degrees. And all of a sudden they've got leaks. And I remember looking at this roof in uh, New Orleans and uh, she was telling me about her leak. And I said, you know, uh, that's not a leak, that's condensation. And she said, why do you say that? I said, well, it hasn't rained in about three weeks, yet your leak is active. It's wet right now. It's dripping. <laughs> and I said, 
look at your thermostat. I said, you've got a set of 67 degrees. And I said, just on the other side of this, you've got 95 degrees and probably close to 100% humidity. And she was like, wow. She's like, well, how do I fix that? I said, unfortunately, I said, whoever put this on, put ice and water shield on the whole roof. And I said, you're going to have to come up with a, a clever way to vent the roof. And how this comes about is this. The installation of these historic materials takes a lot of knowledge, training, and time. And a lot of times you'll get uh, roofers that aren't trained in it, and they just slam the roofs down as fast as they can. So the slates, they're overnailed, they're undernailed. The copper can't move, uh, so it, it cracks. You know, copper expands and contracts a lot in the heat and cold. So when it cracks, you know, you've got leaks. So what they do is they ice and water shield the whole roof, and that's actually your roof covering. And so it keeps the water out, but those kind of roofs don't last a long time. When they're slammed down like that and they're undernailed, overnailed, the copper can't move, you've got basically leaks all over it, but the ice and water shield is holding it out. And that's what I was saying, the, the slate and tile roofs here in the U.S. don't really compare to the slate and tile roofs in Europe on the most part because uh, there's not the, the training program, so to speak, here in the U.S. that you have in, in Germany and France and the U.K. And uh, there's this um, whole idea about speed and, and uh, how cheap something can be done. And I think it's much better to do it right than slam a roof down and that's that's kind of what happens here in the u.s yeah yeah that's so true sometimes i wish we were a little more european but yeah but yeah. you didn't hear that from me <laughs> <laughs> um so going into that with the amount of you know training it takes um, to put on these amazing roofs. Are there any grants or incentives available when ho when a homeowner is choosing slate roofing due to its, you know, sustainability and durability? Yeah, so it really varies from um, one state to another mm -hmm. and what's available. We've done a lot of uh, jobs where they receive grant money. Um, you know, certain historic foundations, uh, the government... Uh, it really depends on what your building is, when it was built, um, what kind of significance it has. But yeah, we've done a lot of work on, on buildings that have received all kinds of grants. And that's real helpful because, you know, slate, tile, copper roofs, they're, they're very expensive materials. They're extremely long lasting. And if you think about it, they're actually the cheapest roof by right. time, but, um, you know, the upfront cost takes a bit. So I would suggest that anybody that has one that, that needs replacement, go and find out what kind of grants, uh, what kind of things are available to help. Uh, but oftentimes these roofs are, are repairable because if you think back to a lot of these very old time roofs, uh, they were installed by people who came over here from Germany or France or UK or, or, or right. wherever. And many of them were installed correctly. So they're very repairable. And that's why I was saying like, you know, the, the St. Asaph Cathedral in Wales, you know, 470 years, but it had a lot of repairs over that time. You know, when a windstorm right. came and knocked the slate or two off, it was repaired and repaired co correctly. When the, uh, flashings wore off probably uh lead because they, they like to use lead over there in the uk uh when the uh, lead flashings wore out they tore out the slate around it replaced the lead flashings and put the slate back in you know so that's usually a lot lot less expensive than going with a new roof and you can you know repair a lot of these roofs. I mean, we've repaired roofs that are pre-revolutionary and they're still wow. holding up. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, in the D.C. area, we've done it in Charleston, we've done it in, in New Orleans. You know, um, homes are, uh, you know, very, very old that we've restored and, you know, they're they're fabulous. But that's why I was saying it has to be installed correctly or what happens is you have so many uh, cracked and, and broken slates in trying to do a repair that it becomes unfeasible. And that's what happens when, you know, a lot of these um, uh, companies come out after a hailstorm and they, they try and total out a whole slate roof. And so many times it's repairable, but in their eyes, it's not repairable because they're not comfortable with uh, doing the repairs on it uh, and, and knowing that it'll, it'll work out in the long run because uh, they're used to slates being over nailed, under nailed and flashing is being done incorrectly and, and all kinds of problems. But like I said, you know, gosh, any old city, and it's not just slate, you know, if you go to Venice or, or, or Madrid or, or, you know, these places that have uh, uh, tile roofs, I mean, there's like a sea of tile roofs, meaning that 95% of the roofs are tile. And most of them are 100, 200, 300, 400 years old. You know, they withstood all the hailstorms, all the windstorms, just by repairs. They don't always need to be torn off. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's cool and something we should get back to. Yeah. More repair, absolutely. less re replace. Right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So for a building to support a slate roof, are there any specific, you know, structural requirements that the building needs to have in order to support like the weight of that material? Absolutely. So um, slate is a very heavy material, you know, standard slates, you know, quarter to three eighths inch slate is generally about 850 pounds per square. That's, that's a, a 10 by 10 area or hundred square feet. Um, and then if you get, say like a, a denser stone, like a Del Castillo or, um, Buckingham, um, something like that, you know, that goes up to about 950 or a or thousand pounds per square. And then wow. also if you go with thick slates, you know, um, we put on a, a roof in uh, Missouri a couple years ago. Um, it required 12 semi tractor trailer loads of slate because the slate was a uh, half to three quarter inch thick. And it was also a very large roof. But, you know, if you think about the, the weight of that, you know, that's going to be somewhere around, gosh, 2,500 or, or even 3,000 pounds a square. So it's really got to be built to withstand um, not just the slate, but also if you're in a cold weather climate, all the snow that's going to build up on that roof. So in building a, a, a new house for a slate roof, You've got to take all that into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. That really slides beautifully into the next question, which is, yeah. I mean, compared to other roofing materials, like, I mean, just the weight alone, slate differs. Yeah. Um, but you've touched on it here and there, but how does the installation process differ for slate from, you know, these other materials like asphalt, metal, what what have you? Well, um, so... Asphalt, you know, you just basically run some lines and you have an air gun and you just shoot them down as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. um, metal, it kind of depends on what kind of a metal roof you're talking about. But a lot of what gets put on in the U.S. here, you know, you basically need a screw gun. It's either exposed nails or, you know, you've got the, the cleats where you just you know, screw one in one right after another and just snap them on. And it, it's very fast. I mean, it, it's more of a production cycle yeah. than it is like a, a, a long lasting kind of thing. Whereas with slate, um, it takes a little bit to install it correctly. Um, you've got to nail it just perfect. You don't have a lot of tolerance. Like I said, you over nail it just a little bit. And you've got hairline cracks. You undernail it and the slate above it rocks on it. And so every single windstorm, every single hailstorm, 
you get broken slates. You know, I, I remember inspecting a roof in Amarillo and um, it was less than a year old. And this is a big roof now, but it had over 300 missing slates. And the general contractor was trying to tell me that, um, well, you know, that's pretty standard because by my calculator, he's like, you know, it's, it's only like 3% of the roof. And it's not that big of a deal because I was told that a slate roof sheds like five to 10% a year. I said, so it's natural for 300 slates to fall out. I'm like, that's insane. I'm like, think about this. I said, you've got these big sharp pieces of slate that are flying off your roof every <laughs> year. They could hit your car. They could hit your kids. I, I was just like, what kind of, he goes, well, how many should fall out? I said, zero. You know, I said, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might have one or two or something, you know, you know, as an installer, you know, you tap it and you, you, you know, you can usually hear that, that ring or that thud and know if it's cracked or not, but you know, there's forklifts driving around, whatever, maybe you miss one or two and one or two gets installed and after a year, you know, a, a couple fall out, you know, that, that could happen, but to have that many fall out after a year is crazy. And, and yeah. you know, for people to say that that's normal, that's normal if you're a gorilla, you know, if, if you're just, <laughs> you're a shingle roofer and you're just slamming those slates down as fast as possible. But Ooh, in general, mm -hmm. Yeah, you should have zero or, 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 you know, less than five, put it that way. You shouldn't have too many. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's the thing. The, the, the tolerance for the install isn't very high. And then there's also the issue of slate generally goes with copper here in the U.S. And copper has to be installed an exact way because when it gets hot, or when it gets cold, it expands and it contracts. And it does all kinds of different things. And if you don't install it correctly, you've got problems. You know, it's not the copper itself that's that expensive. It's the labor to install it correctly. And what I see here in the U.S. so often is caulk joints or solder joints where the person really doesn't know how to do that. And what I mean by that is that the solder joint is, is cold, meaning that the, the iron wasn't hot enough to draw all the, the solder back and give it a good uh, uh, joint, or it wasn't cleaned well, or it was installed in such a way that the copper will bind and tear. So when the, the copper gets hot and cold, like I said, it expands and contracts. So Let's say you've got a, a built-in gutter or a chimney or something where you've soldered the whole thing together. Now it can't move, you know, it can't move, but every time it gets hot, it moves, but it's got nowhere to go. So what happens is the solder joints break or the copper itself will tear, you know, I have actually seen where the copper itself tears because it was soldered so well it's actually stronger than the copper, but the force of the movement is much more than the strength of the copper. So the copper will actually tear. And sometimes it's a design issue um, where you have to get very creative with how you install it. But oftentimes it's just a lack of understanding. You know, over in Europe, most of the people there solder very little. They, they, they fold everything. They use pinch seams. Um, and you can do that. I mean, you don't have to solder. Um, we kind of do a little bit of both. Uh, we solder and we pinch the seams depending on the application. But there are certain times where you actually have to pinch the seams because soldering won't work. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, um, there's a job we did in um, Washington, D.C., it was the Norwegian embassy and they wanted pre-patinaed copper. And the whole thing of that is, yeah, the whole thing of that is that the Statue of Liberty, all that copper actually came from Norway, went from Norway, oh. went to France, France made it, 
gave it to the U.S., and the Norwegian embassy said, hey, we want a green copper roof, even though it's brand new. And when I saw the specs for it, I was saying, well, you know, you've got a lot of issues here. I said, you know, you've got a 20-ounce double-locked standing seam roof that's curved, and then it goes up a wall, and then at the bottom it's got a built-in gutter. I'm like, your specs show all these joints to be soldered. I'm like, mm. so you've got several issues with it. I said, number one is it's pre-patinaed. So you're going to have to wire wheel all of that patina off, acid etch it to get it available for solder. Then you have to solder it and you have to be able to solder it so it doesn't run down your pre-patinaed face. And then you're going to have to try and pre-patina all around your solder. Plus your solder won't get that patina. So it's going to look god awful. It was like, that's oh, the first no. thing. I said, the second thing is you've got this really long run and you're going to have this super long solder joint on there. I said, what do you think is going to happen when it gets hot and cold? It's going to tear. You know, I said, it's an impossibility what you've got specified. And so basically what we decided to do was we made pinch seams. So we, we, we folded all of the copper so that it was all locked together but it moved and nothing was soldered so that it could move and we didn't have to wire wheel anything. And then at the top where we rolled it out, uh, we, we made what it's called bread pans. So we took the standing seam panels and we folded it back uh, around itself and it made like a, a little cup to uh, grab the backside standing seam roof. And it basically allowed the, the front roof and the back roof to move independently of each other. And it's vital in that situation because it's a, uh, the front of it is got all these trees on it and the back's a courtyard. So the sun, the way it hits it, when it comes over the horizon, parts of it are going to get a lot of sun, parts of it are going to get no sun, and it changes through the day. So different parts of that roof are going to get super hot while other parts are very cool and it's going to make that copper really contort and the solder joints just won't work in that instance. So there's, there's situations like that where you actually have to use pinch seams or it just won't work. And then there's certain times where you have to use a combination you know, we, we did a, a project also in Washington, D.C., in, in Georgetown. Actually, the, the rumor is that's actually where Lunfont and Washington drew up the plans on how to design the city. So, oh, whoa. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very old building. And, uh, you know, it's a restaurant now. And so before, you know, having a big copper roof that was low pitched and there weren't any problems, but now because it's a restaurant, it's got all these vents, it's got these big HVAC units, mm. and it's got all these fixed points. And so all those fixed points can't move. So we had to uh, basically make soldered seams around those fixed points, and then we use um, standing seam panels with pinch seams to allow everything to float. And then in the big pan, because it was almost uh, like made less than 112 pitch, it was pretty flat. We soldered that, but we, we locked it on to the standing seam. So everything floats and moves. And, you know, you look at a project like that and it's like, I understand why they keep having to re-roof it again and again and again and again, because they're thinking, well, we're going to put a copper roof on there it should last a hundred years, but it only lasts five because all the solder joints keep breaking and they go up there and then they caulk it and they put tar on it. And uh, it, every time it gets hot and cold, that tar and caulk cracks because it moves again. And so they have to reseal it and they're, they're scratching their heads like, what's going on? Well, there is an instance where you need to solder everything where you're going to have the ice and snow build up. 
and then you're going to need to lock everything to it so that it can move without binding and tearing. So I hope that answers the question. Maybe I went a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> no, you no, went you... in depth. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. Yeah. Um, and I know we've, we've touched on this a little bit already, but can you tell us a little bit more about the different types or grades of slate and maybe how a homeowner should choose, you know, how do they choose the best option for their home and where they, they live? Sure, absolutely. So um, there's different gradation systems depending on the country. Here in the U.S., we have S1, S2, and S3. S1 is the highest grade, meaning that it's going to last uh, over 75 years. S2 is a gradation that says it's going to start to deteriorate between 40 and 75 years. And S3 means it won't last um, 40 years. So obviously, you don't want anything that's an S3 grade slate. Um, S2 slates are, are um, they have been somewhat common in the old days. You know, all of your Pennsylvania blacks were, or I shouldn't say all of them, but the most predominant Pennsylvania slate, Pennsylvania bed blacks, were an S2 slate. And you would generally start to see it flake up around 40 to 50 years. But the interesting thing with that is that Pennsylvania slate, if you repair it and, and uh, maintain it well, a lot of those roofs will last 100 years sometimes a little more, um, sometimes a little less, unfortunately. But around that mark, you know, um, S1 slates, it just means that it's over 75 years. So sometimes you'll have slates that are okay that are S1, but you'll have uh, very good slates that are S1. Like, so here in the U.S., most of our slate today comes from the, the Vermont, New, New York area. Um, you know, Vermont greens, Vermont blacks, reds, et cetera. And most of those slates will last over 150 years if they're maintained properly. You know, and that's the thing. They've got to be installed properly and maintained properly. Yeah. And then, you know, you'll have, like I said, your uh, Buckingham or your Grayson slate that's quarried in Virginia that we don't actually know how long it'll last. I mean, the, the oldest Buckinghams still ring true like, like a brand new slate. Um, you know, originally, um, way back uh, in its old ownership, Buckingham had a guarantee that said it'll last for as long as the building stands. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that Buckingham would last hundreds and hundreds of years. I, wow. I think that it's... Uh, got the hardness uh, of like a, a Welsh slate or, or something like that, you know? So you've got your S1s, S2s, S3s. The, the main thing here that you've got to be careful of is um, your low-grade imports. Uh, most of your uh, slates that you get from um, Asia, um, Africa, um, and Brazil aren't the greatest quality of slate um, for one reason or other. Um, it's not that all the slates are bad, but a lot of what you'll get from those countries here in the U.S. is not very good. Uh, Spain, which is the largest uh, producer of slate, is kind of like a mix. There's some really, really great slate from Spain, um, and there's some slates that are good. And then there's some slates that aren't so good. And you really have to understand your Spanish slate and know who you're buying it from mm -hmm. to purchase and use Spanish slate. You know, you've got, um, you know, like Coupa, for instance, you know, they're, they're your largest uh, producer of slate. But, you know, when somebody says Coupa, they don't understand that Coupa has got like 28 different pits. <laughs> it's like, which one are you talking about? Is it Koopa 14, Koopa 7? I mean, which one are you talking about? And that gives you an idea of, of your lifespan. You know, is it Koopa 14? Is that, you know, that's a pretty good slate. You know, 
uh, over there, you've got uh, Del Carmen's. You know, Del Carmen's are a great slate. You know, uh, if you go over to uh, uh, that part of Spain, you'll see Del Carmen slates are uh, 200 years old. You know, so uh, you've got some really good slate there. Um, a lot of your other European slates, uh, they don't get imported here. Um, just due to that, they don't produce that much of it. So they use it locally. Um, like I said, you know, like Delible, for instance, you know, pretty much all of Delible is only used in the UK. Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. slate, the last 250 to 275 years, but, you know, you can't really buy it and, and ship it to the US. You know, it was funny because I was, I was talking to Morgan, the, the owner. I said, so let's say I had somebody that just absolutely wanted Delible. What would it cost? And he said, well, He's like, it's going to cost you right around $3,000 a square. Uh, and then we're going to have to package it and ship it to the port and then, you know, ship it to the U.S. He goes, I'm going to guess it's going to be about $4,000 or $5,000 a square by the time it, it gets to you. So it, it becomes like impossible to use. You know, even Welsh slate, you know, if you look mm -hmm. at Penryn slate, it's a fabulous slate, but it's it's pretty expensive. I mean... To get it over here and use it, you're you're well over a thousand dollars a square. I mean, it's it's approaching the price of of you know Vermont Reds, which is always thought of as the most expensive slate. Um, so there's there's a lot of different slates from all over the world. the The main thing is you would have to select somebody that you trust if it's an importer to import that slate, and you also have to trust your installer. You know, um, I've seen where switcheroos have been done and the installer thought he was installing a certain product and he wasn't. And ideally, your, your installer knows what he's installing, you know. Um, I, oh, I, I forgot about a, another uh, really good slate. Uh, it's from Canada. It's called North Country Black. Um, we just used it in, in Texas and Austin at the... Um, uh, Capital Visitor Center, and it's oh, a cool. fabulous slate. Yeah, so um, that lasts. Uh, you know, it's Nest One slate lasts well over a hundred years. Um, so there's a lot of good slate, but you've got to pick the right slate for your house. And the biggest thing is the installer. You know, are they going to install it without over nailing and under nailing? Are they going to install it with the correct flashings? Are going are they going to install the flashings? so that they move and, you know, that, that's, that's really what's key. So the longevity, yeah, you've got these S1, S2, S3s, but in the real world, it doesn't mean a lot, unfortunately. Right. Well, you're just sliding into all the rest of our questions so well. <laughs> you're guiding the conversation. So um, you touched on maintenance and mm. how important it is to, yeah. you know, not eventually needing to replace your slate roof. Right. So what are those maintenance tips and tricks that homeowners should be aware of for their slate roofs? Yeah, they, they should basically get in inspected every year, two years, three years. Okay. And if there's any broken or missing slates, um, you know, same on clay tile roof, you know, make sure that they get replaced. Um, check the underlayment, uh, any flashings. You know, a lot of these old roofs, they were installed with uh, something called turn metal. Um, what turn metal is, is it's carbon steel that was coated with a, a, a tin and lead coating. Uh, this was made by Fallensby all the way up until, gosh, I want to say the early to mid-90s. And then with the EPA cracking down, they came out with something called turn two. And turn two was the same carbon steel, but it had a, a, a tin zinc coating and um, to get away from the lead. And they had a lot of product failures. Uh, so Fallensby actually went out of business and, um, you know, turn isn't made here in the U.S. anymore. But back in the day, we loved turn, especially the double X turn. The double X turn was 26 gauge turn and we used it all the time. But the, the thing with turn is that um, it's got to be maintained. It's got to be painted. Um, 
it has to be uh, taken care of in a very certain way. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, when you get condensation on the backside of turn, it rusts from the underside out. So um, that, that was another thing where when people put ice and water shield underneath turn flashings or turn uh, box gutters or something like that, the turn metal roof would just rust out in sometimes a year or two um, where it should last, you know, 80 to 100 years if, if maintained correctly. But yeah, what you've got to do with those old turn uh, roofs and, and flashings and everything is you've got to um, uh, find any rust there is and use a rust neutralizer or a rust converter to, to uh, stop the rust. And then uh, you've got to paint it um, with a, a really good paint. Um, unfortunately, you know, they, they got rid of all the the really, really heavy duty paints uh, that we used to use like 20 years ago. But um, <laughs> if you keep them uh, painted uh, and, and stop any of the rust, that goes a long ways, you know, keeping your gutters clean, you know, making sure that uh, birds mm -hmm. aren't building nests where they shouldn't, or, um, you know, raccoons and squirrels aren't uh, chewing up um, your, your lead uh, pipe flashings or, or tearing up your, uh, your chimney covers or anything like that. So uh, maintenance wise, it's good just to have it inspected and make sure all those little things are taken care of because they can lead to a lot, lot of damage if they go um, and just keep on going. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. And so, you know, in addition, you mentioned that hiring the right installer is really key for preserving this investment, your slate, slate roof. So how can property owners ensure that they're hiring, you know, a qualified professional to install this material on their roof? Well, any really good installer is going to follow uh, the National Slate Association Standards and Installation Guide. And um, your, your real slaters will actually be um, uh, probably members of the Slate Roofing Contractors Association as a slate contractor. You know, they have different um, categories of membership. You know, you can be, I think, a consultant, uh, you know, various different things. And you can be a contractor. But to actually do a, a, a lot of slate, you have to be, um, or you, you would then be a, a slate contractor, a slate roofing contractor. So there's a category called contractor and there's a category called slate roofing contractor. So there's a little bit of it. And then also you want a company that's very, very well versed in that type of roofing or that type of slate. Um, so have they worked on that type of slate a lot? You know, um, I remember somebody asked me once that they're like, uh, well, where did you get all this from? I, I've probably been on like a thousand roofs and I've never heard of that. Like, How many roofs have you been on? And this is many years ago. I said, I don't know, probably 10,000. And he looked at me in total disbelief. He said, 10,000. I said, oh yeah. I'm like, you know, a, a, a durable estimator goes out and looks at, you know, six to eight roofs a day. And I said, so in a week, you're looking at 30 or 40 roofs. In a year, you're looking at, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 roofs. I said, you know, in five, six years, if you're an estimator, you've been on 10,000 roofs. And I said, that's, you know, pretty standard. And he was just like, wow. And I said, but I said a lot of the difference is that we work all over the country. So we've seen ice dams where, you know, I remember I saw this, uh, this roof in Massachusetts. And if I hadn't seen the actual picture with the guy that actually took the picture, it, it looked like it was Photoshop because there was over 10 feet of snow sitting on top of this roof. And you were, you would think, how's that stay on there? You would think it would just fall off. But, you know, you have extreme conditions like that. And then, say, down in South Florida, you've got hurricane-force winds. 
And, you know, depending on where you're at, you've got all kinds of different um, environmental aspects. You know, down in um, New Orleans, you've got flying termites. You know, if you've got uncovered wood, you know, if you don't use drip edge, well, the termites gonna, are going to swarm and they're just going to eat your wood right out from underneath your slate and your slate will just fall off the roof. Oh, so, my God. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. horrifying. <laughs> yeah. We're getting ready to do this this roof in Beverly Hills. They've got earthquakes, you know, mm. and if you don't, you know, make sure that you're this is a clay tile roof. If that you don't make sure that your clay tile and your your copper can handle a little jiggle, well, it's all going to break, you know. Mm. So you, you've got to be able, able to understand what's happening in that location. You know, what are the extremes? Are you going to get a 150 mile an hour winds? You know, you know, there, there's certain roofs in Florida where we used foam installation because, you know, you, you're going to have 150 mile an hour winds. Um, so there's certain things that you want to do depending on what you're running into. And uh, each location, you just have to make sure that uh, you, you, you follow along with what's the most extreme thing that's going to happen here. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of going off of that too, how, like in the insurance world, mm -hmm. um, extreme weather makes me think of insurance. <laughs> yeah. How does slate roofing impact a building's insurance premium and maybe it's resale value too? Well, you know, as far as insurance premiums, they, there's such a wide range in that depending on location and company. Um, so there's, gosh, there's everything in the middle. But as far as like resale value, it's huge because, you know, people want that old historic look um, and they, they, they fall in love with that, um, that history of it. So when you tear off a slate roof and put shingles on or, put, um, you know, standing seam metal that, you know, isn't historic, it throws everything off and that resale value, it's going to go down the tubes. Um, you know, it just, it kind of depends on what it looks like and, and how it's taken. But, you know, a lot of these, especially like these synthetic roofs, here's a funny story. A few years ago uh, uh, in our home office, literally like a mile from our shop, uh, there was a hailstorm and there was these two old Victorians and um, uh, one of them, uh, we tore the roof off. It was, they were both uh, Pennsylvania black slates. One of them, we tore the slate roof off, installed a new North country black, all copper flashings looked beautiful. And across the street, they put a synthetic on. It was a synthetic roof that was black. They used copper flashings and, you know, one of our guys said, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. You know, they look identical because the North <laughs> Country black lays so flat. It looks like a synthetic. And he's just like, wow. And, and I was like, really? And this is the funny thing. So a year later, our roof looks the same. That roof is all curled up. It's discolored and it looks like hell. And so, you know, that, that, that's the funny thing. It's like, wow. you, you get that contrast of longevity, you know, slate's a time tested material. It's been around for centuries, you know, yeah. uh, the, the quarry that we went to uh, visit in Wales, you know, they were quarrying all the way back in the 1400s, you know? So these old slate roofs, these old tile roofs, they're time tested. They've been around for centuries. Many of them have lasted for centuries, but here in the U S things are, are a little different where a lot of people are more of like a, a throwaway society. They want everything fast and cheap. And yeah. so you get these synthetics that look like slate, at least in the beginning, but they're just terrible roofs. You know, none of them last very long. Um, 
And then also the, the, the whole install, you know, instead of installing it correctly, making sure that all the slates are nailed correctly so that they last, you know, a lot of these roofs, they're just slammed on. And that's why some of them have such difficulties in storms. You know, that's why you have so much breakage sometimes in hailstorms or windstorms, uh, these, these newer roofs, because they're not installed correctly. They're overnailed, they're undernailed, so they have no give. So you got wind, you got hail, and all of a sudden you've got 300 slates missing. And instead of, you know, putting it on right and lasting 100, 200, 300 years, you've got these issues. So that's, uh, that's what you've got there. <laughs> oh, amazing. Is there anything else you think property owners should know about slate roofing? Um, well, you know, it's a beautiful roof and yeah. it, you know, you, you just want to make sure that you select the right look for your home, you know, the right color, the right texture, the right consistency. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you choose the, the right flashing, you know, uh, the right gauge of flashing. And most importantly, your installer. Your installer is the most important part Huge. of that. And it's kind of strange, but price isn't really where you want to go with that. You want to go with a, a time-tested installer that's installed quality roofs, you know, time and time and time again. And the the nailing and the flashings are vital to um, a, a perfect slate roof. That is such great advice and so true. I think you've given the home and building owners that listen to this podcast some really great tips for picking out their next roof. I hope they all go with slate. I mean, like you said, it is truly time tested um, yeah. without a doubt. And I think that's so cool. And um, I'm with you on the sentiment of, you know, being a culture of repair rather than replace. So, yes. Thank you so much, John. You, your wisdom has infected us today. Well, thanks for having me. That's It's been great. Thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And to everyone out there listening, you can learn more about the Durable Slate um, company on their directory on RooferscoffeeShop.com and AskARoofer.com. You can also uh, follow them on Instagram and Facebook and all of the places. Um, make sure you stay up to date with all of the Ask a Roofer podcasts. So click the little bell button and get notifications every time we post a new episode. Lauren, this has been a great episode. I know. I learned so much about Slate that I had no idea about. Yay! Thank you, John. <laughs> I know. Same. You're welcome. Thank you all so much, and we'll be seeing you next time on the Ask a Roofer podcast. Great job, Yay, John. That was awesome. See how passionate he is about it. He truly loves what he's doing. And I mean, all the projects that they've worked on, you know, in DC and in the US yeah. and even abroad, you know, some of those, you know, amazing stories that he had about slate roofs that are lasting hundreds and hundreds of years is truly amazing. Yeah, and and how they can like be accurate with how long they'll last because they're like, oh yeah, Joe Schmo's house down the road was built in 1492 and it still has the same roof on. That's crazy. I know. Yeah, really wild. And just hearing yeah. him talk about the different quarries and all the different, you know, grades and styles of slate roofing that are available to people is yeah. pretty, I mean, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, too. It made me think, I think a few years ago, um, Tim and Heidi went to the Slate Association's, like, annual meetings and got to see a slate quarry up in Vermont. And I remember them both just kind so of cool. being, yeah, like, blown away by how cool it was and yeah. getting to see the, the slate made right there, like, or, like, chipped and, like, shaped right there in person was really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um. I think that we should definitely have an episode with him again on clay tile roofs. And copper, because apparently and slate and copper. copper go hand in hand, which I didn't realize. Yes, I didn't yeah. either. And that building he was talking about in for the Norway embassy, 
that it was interesting. It was funny that they wanted the copper patina already. So like green rather than, you know, copper. Right. Um, that's fun. <laughs> I know. I know. And just slate is such a sustainable material because it can last up to, you know, 200 plus years, which is, is pretty incredible, especially because the trend now with home building owners is we're all about sustainability, which is great. So slate, mm-hmm. slate's where it's at too. Yeah, Slate really is where it's at because also, like we mentioned quite a few times in the podcast, like leaning into the repair versus replace mentality. And I think that's something, you know, like our country kind of isn't all about (laughs) and we could be more about. So um, and not just our country, you know, a lot of places in the world and just the world in general, we're kind of a what's next Right. Um, society exactly. rather mm-hmm. than, you know, I'll just keep what I have and make sure it's nice. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, lots of fun facts and interesting info, historical info about slate roofing and looking forward to having John on the podcast again. Me too. And hopefully one day I have a slate roof. <laughs> I know. Definitely. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll see you on the next one, Lauren. Yeah, I can't wait. See you then. If your roof needs answers, subscribe now to the Ask a Roofer podcast. We've got your questions covered one episode at a time. Go to askaroofer.com to submit your questions and learn more. Stay tuned and keep those questions coming.